Well, first off, just so I get to know you particularly, because yeah. just in the spirit yeah. of this conference, what is at this point that you've come to appreciate to be the message that you want to bring? You know, not just on this conference, you know, assuming that there is a life message. If there were a life message, what would you say your message is your, that, that you've come to appreciate right. from all your reading? It doesn't but, have to necessarily be vitalistic. No, 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 no. That the universe, uh, that life, that the universe is essentially, in some mysterious way, biocentric. In other words, the organization of the cosmos is such that life was an inevitable product of the cosmos. Outcome, order, right. Right? Had to be. And so, so the, the design of the thing, like, a, like I don't like to use the word watch in the context of a vitalist conference, but you know, just as <laughs> all the cogs of a watch fit together towards the end of telling time, so the, the way that the, the frequency with which supernovae explode in the sky, right? If it's too right. frequent, every, all life in a galaxy is wiped out, right? Right. And every, everything is fine-tuned to get the atoms of life onto a planet like ours and then, you know, to, to facilitate the coming of life. So in other words, basically, life, the, the existence of life in the cosmos, and I would say intelligent life like humans, is actually built right into the structure of nature from the very beginning. And I think that's the main take-home lesson of modern science. That's how do we bridge, main, main, how do we bridge my, modern science with that understanding? It seems to be that that understanding kind of rhymes, lies in the background, well, not the foreground. And that could, for me, that seems to be one of the challenges. Well, the connection, of course, is that you have to now propose mindfulness or intelligence somewhere to account for this, right? Mm -hmm. Because the design is so improbable. I mean, a wonderful quote from you know, Fred Hoyle. You know, young mm -hmm. Fred Hoyle is here. I mean, he went out to Caltech after mm -hmm. World War II, and he's a sort of, you know, hard-talking Yorkshireman from Northern England, and a very unkempt, you know. <laughs> and he went up to Willie Fowler, and he said, the only way you can get carbon in the universe is by some, having certain energy levels, right, in beryllium, you know, the carbon atom. And this is very, very famous for this. It's the major discovery probably in 20th century physics, actually. He said, you have to have these energy levels, and Willie Fowler said they're wildly improbable. They couldn't, couldn't exist in nature. But then, of course, he sneaked down to the atom smasher at Caltech. We had one there, you see. And they did the experiments, and he, he suggested, right? And the stagger, he staggered them all. Because here was this sort of unkempt, sort of you know, irreverent figure. Mm -hmm. Hard atheist then he was, of course. Wow. But, yeah. Made, made a prediction of staggering consequence. And they wrote a famous paper, and they all got the Nobel Prize from the paper, right? When they predicted these wildly improbable energy levels. And that day that they discovered it down at the... Down at an underground in the, in the Caltech atom smasher, Hoyle went from atheist to theist wow. because he couldn't believe that he said it's so improbable that this, this, these, these relationships exist, which mean that this, the building of atoms can go beyond beryllium to carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and so forth. You see. 